Morning, everybody. Thanks very much for tuning in. Um, I'm going to give you a bit of an overview of the balance fund, give you a sense of how we've done, where we've done well, where we've struggled a bit, and how the positioning of the portfolio fits in with our current view of the world. This just shows you the track record of the fund over the long term, and you can see it's done particularly well relative to peers, but importantly, it's also outperformed our CPI target of plus four, which we are very proud of. I think as important is obviously the volatility of the fund over time, and here we can show you what the volatility is relative to our peers over the last three years, and I think importantly, we've achieved great returns with low volatility, which really talks to our emphasis on protection of a downside, and you can really see that coming through quite um, clearly here. So what's worked for us and what hasn't worked for us over the last year? So if you look at diversifieds, that's diversified miners. That's done particularly well for the fund. The reason being is that we were very exposed to coal via the likes of Glencore and Tungela. Coal's obviously done, coal and energy has generally done quite well over the last year because of underinvestment and obviously due to the conflict or the war in Ukraine and, and Russia. And we still maintain a reasonable overweight in this space. Um, if you look at the likes of um, currency, you'll see that that also contributed very positively to the fund. when. Um, the regulations changed in SA and that upper bound was moved from 30 to 45 in terms of offshore allocation. We moved quite a bit of um, our rands into dollars and that did particularly well. The rands weakened quite substantially relative to the dollar, primarily from dollar strength, but nonetheless, given that we think that the dollar is actually quite expensive at this level, we have since brought quite a bit of those dollars back into rands. If you look at what's, at what's um, detracted from performance, you'll see it's really our exposure to offshore markets. We have quite a low exposure to offshore markets, and we're obviously going to take you through that. We think they're quite expensive, particularly the US, which is nearly 60% of um, world markets. That's obviously been, or world markets have been under quite a bit of pressure. They're down about 20% over the period, so we are down less than that in our offshore exposure, but we obviously have some offshore exposure, and you can see that was a, a detractor over the period. I'm going to focus on five key, key factors that we think are really key to our outlook of the world and also how they impact um, the portfolio as it sits currently. I'm going to start with geopolitical risks, which is obviously front of mind given that we've just been through the, the, the 20th um, Chinese Party con um, Congress. I'm then going to just touch on US monetary policy, inflation and interest rates. That's obviously also all we pretty much read about in the news these days. Um, what those implications are for US markets. And then just finally some comments on China and the implications for EM and South Africa. And then what that actually means for our investment in SA. We think SA valuations are particularly cheap. I'm going to take you through some examples of that and show you why we have quite a still why we still have quite a sizable exposure to um, to our domestic market. So starting with geopolitical risks, I think we're all aware that geopolitical risks and tensions are certainly higher than they have been for quite some time, um, pretty much higher than they've been in most of our lifetimes. And that obviously would suggest that you need some kind of risk premium in markets that needs to be higher than it's been historically, and we obviously need to bear that in mind when we look at valuations of markets, and we try and look at valuations currently and compare that with history. We need to accept that history might be a little bit generous if we are going to adjust it for these geopolitical political tensions. We've just come through the, the we've just finished the, the, the chi we finished China's 20th party um, conference. It was certainly a lot worse, or the outcomes were a lot worse than we would have expected. We don't think they are positive for, um, you know, for global risk, and we don't think they're particularly positive for Chinese growth and for assets that are listed in, in China. I mean, as a result, we've actually reduced our, our Chinese exposure in the portfolios quite substantially due to that. Um, the tailwind that the globe has experienced in terms of earnings growth across most markets is obviously going to be a bit of a headwind now as trade becomes less between the world and, and China. And we have yet, we yet to unpack that into detail, but we certainly think it is a negative going, um, going forward. As for a ceasefire in Russia or Ukraine, that certainly does not look imminent, and that certainly suggests we will see elevated energy prices still for quite, um, for quite some time, which is obviously a particular headwind for the likes of, um, of the European economy and European markets. If we look at US inflation, 
that's obviously remained very sticky, a lot more sticky than would have been expected um, in terms of actual inflation prints. If we look at what the market has been expecting in terms of inflation, in other words, what's discounted into bonds in the US, and if we look particularly long term, so we're looking at what's implied by US bonds from year five to 10 years out, you can look at the, if you look at the, the dark blue line, you can see that that's remained fairly stable and close to the 2% level that the Fed targets. So that's not surprising. The Fed's been particularly hawkish, and if they are to be believed, they are going to break this inflation up cycle. You're definitely going to see some turn in inflation downwards from goods, but obviously the larger component is services and a key driver of that in wages, which has remained incredibly sticky and high. That's not surprising given where we see unemployment, which is at record low levels. It's pretty much at trough levels. This has obviously kept wage inflation elevated. We certainly expect this to rise given that we are, we, we are in a position or we are in a place where monetary policy is quite tight. So this, it's really just a matter of when it turns up, not if. When it turns up, it usually moves by more than 2%, and that usually results in a recession, as you can see from the slide. And also importantly, when you have a recession and unemployment moves up, we inevitably have earnings downgrades, um, or we have a reduction in earnings. And if you look at most recessions over the last 40 years, earnings usually go down at least 20%, if not quite a bit more. In extreme cases, if we go back to 10 years ago, we looked at something closer to 50. So that's obviously quite a headwind for, for markets. And really what you can see here is, the, is, the, is a chart of US earnings where we can illustrate the problem that I've just spoken about. If you look at expectations going forward, you can see it's quite elevated. It's way above where trend is. It needs to come down, and it will come down. As I said, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when it'll come down. And we see earnings, if they go below trend, you could easily see earnings coming down 15 to 20% from here, which certainly is not discounted in US markets and would obviously be negative going forward. The other factor to consider when we talk about U.S. markets and our concern about them being overvalued, it isn't just earnings, it's actually the, the valuation piece. And really here what we're doing is we're comparing U.S. markets to competing asset classes. In particular, we're looking at um, the returns from bonds and we're looking at real returns. If you look at where real yields have been over the last 10 years, they've been incredibly depressed at about close to zero. To be precise, it's been about 30 basis points, but that is certainly not a sufficient return for a bondholder, and it's certainly not sufficient if you look at history. You can see if we go back 10 years earlier, they were at about 1.7, which would really fit in with the rule of thumb that we often use, which is that real rates should be close to what real GDP growth should be. So we've recently had, obviously, a rocketing in those real rates, and they are now back to more historic levels. At 1.6, we far more in line with what they've been historically, and that's partly driven the underperformance in equity markets that we've seen. But if you look at equity market PEs or valuations, and we overlay them over those two periods of where we have normal real rates of, let's say, 1.7 versus the current period or the last 10 years of 0.3, you can see it's not surprising that um, PEs rose over the last 10 years. They've now come down as real rates have adjusted, but even at a 15.6 PE, and today it's probably a little bit above 16 since the slide is a few days out of date, it's still much higher than the 14.5 that we've, um, that, that probably a more normal rate and a more normal real rate environment. So that's obviously a headwind for markets going forward. And then just to reiterate the point that I mentioned earlier about geopolitical risk, we also need to bear in mind that when we look at the history here, there wasn't the same level of geopolitical tension and risk. If we factor that in, that should argue for even lower PE than we've had, which is obviously a, uh, a sizable concern for us going forward in terms of US markets. And it's why we have such an underweight exposure to the US in the, in the funds. So just finally to move on to South Africa where we are seeing a lot of uh, value. In terms of economic factors, um, there obviously is a bit of a concern given, you know, given what transpired at the conference in, um, in, in, in China, which we and I think the markets felt was certainly a lot more negative than would have been expected. That obviously does weigh on EM sentiment. We are part of the EM basket. If we do get less spend from China on commodities, that obviously directly impacts South Africa economically in terms of our budget deficits and our trade balance. So those factors over the short term can certainly be a bit negative for, for SA and are certainly worse than what we would have hoped for. However, having said that, Valuations in South Africa are especially generous. Um, we really don't need much economic growth in SA to get a reasonable return out of many shares listed on the SA exchange. And really what I'm showing in this slide 
is the dividend yields, which are in circles for a number of shares. I've spread it over quite a number of, um, of, of, of sectors, which is also quite comforting to know that there's a diversification. You can get a, quite a diversified exposure to value on the SA market. If I look at some of the self-help examples that we often talk about, and really these are companies that are not dependent on a buoyant SA, econ uh, on a buoyant SA economy. It's really through internal fixing of businesses, businesses that have been mi mismanaged historically. We have a number of these in SA, and they trade on fairly decent valuations. So you have the likes of Investec on a seven dividend yield, you have Momentum on a 10 dividend yield, and you probably would have seen this morning they actually completed quite a sizable share buyback. So management is also showing their belief in the business and just and also once again endorsing how cheap it is, which we think is, is very positive. If you look at some of the offshore exposure on the JSC, BTI or BAT is obviously well known to everyone. It trades on a very generous dividend yield. It's the kind of share that should do well should we have a continued bear market. It is viewed as uh, obviously defensive shares do well in that kind of environment. Sirius, a little bit lesser known, is a property share primarily exposed to Germany, trading on a seven dividend yield, incredibly well-run business, been growing at a healthy rate for quite some time and expected to grow in very high single digits in euros. So you're going to get a very nice mid-teens return out of this business at this um, at this entry point which we which we obviously like and it's why we've been upping our exposure here in terms of value I've listed some financials like the likes of Absa and Sunlum but in fact you could put most financials into this basket you're really getting our you're, you're really getting record um, record low valuations I don't think Sunlum has ever traded quite at these levels for a business that's probably one of the best run insurers in the in the country trading also at a, quite a sizable discount to its EV for the first time in in many years and then on the mining and resource front I spoke about that a little bit earlier the likes of Glencore Sasol Glencore benefits in particular from these very very elevated coal prices. Over the medium term, they should benefit from higher base metals, which should benefit from a greenification of economies. There's obviously going to be a lot of demand for base metals, and there just is not enough supply if we look out over the medium term. So that should really buoy copper prices and, and similar type base metals, which Glencore has quite sizable exposure to. This is just how the fund looks currently. Um, you'll see at, um, as at the 30th of September, it was sitting at 49%. It is a little bit higher as of today. We're about a month later. We're sitting closer to 54%. Um, what you'll notice here is you'll notice the fairly sizable underweight in offshore equity, and that's really through offshore hedges. Um, in terms of bonds, we have been increasing our exposure to SA bonds. We think the yields are particularly generous. Um, I think the budget that came out yesterday also is probably a little bit better than expectations, so that also should buoy SA bonds going um, going forward. And you'll also notice here the fairly sizable exposure to SA financials and industrials, which I which I spoke about. With that, I will end. Thank you very much, and I will hand over to um, the next speaker.